I suspect every single one of the, you here, when you were a child, you either looked at or had read to you by your mum a children's storybook which depicted a family farm. And I'm trying to imagine it because I, I was one of them. And the, there was the farmyard with the ruddy-faced farmer who probably is just emerging from the milking shed and his wife and children and maybe a stone wall around the edge of the farmyard and there are chickens and there are pigs and there are some cows in a beautiful field just in the background with a hedge around it with lots of wildlife and flowers and there are birds and then there's another field which is growing corn which is just nearly ready to be harvested and there's an atmosphere of happiness and content and a feeling when you're a child that somehow you're connected with this beautiful story of this farm and that you you love it and you feel it's part of you. And of course, it is part of you because you're eating the food from it. So you're intimately connected emotionally and physically with this story. So that's the bit that we got when we were children. And then, and this is the sort of slightly darker bit, perhaps for when we're a little bit older, a strange spell fell upon the lands. And people were possessed with a, some sort of orthodoxy and a mantra uh, we're not really, no one's really sure about what it was caused by. It might have been something in the water. It happened about 60 years ago. And the mantra was the need for cheap food. And everyone fell under this spell. And the spell involved an amnesia, amnesia which disconnected people from the consequences of the actions in order to get the cheap food. So everyone forgot that in order to get cheap food, there will be emissions and there will be destruction of soil and nature and there will be pollution and there will be terrible consequences to animal welfare. But such was the strength of the spell that we were all under that this continued and the small family farms gradually gave up because they just couldn't survive in this tremendously powerful drive towards ever cheaper food and don't forget that people were doing this in the best, with the best of possible intentions, but somehow they forgot the consequences of their actions. But there were a few people who stood up against this. Let's call them sects, this big sort of mantra and this orthodoxy, almost like a religion of cheap food, which prevailed everywhere. The media were into it, the politicians. Most people liked it because it gave them cheap food. But a few people stood up. The environmentalists stood up and said, this can't be right. This is going to end up in tears. The, the animal welfareists stood up against it. And then some interestingly naive people who were called the sustainable food movement. <laughs> they said, and I think they, some of them have been to San Francisco, so they dr they'd drunk some different water. And they said, very naively, this water made them very naive and well-intentioned, and they said, surely, if we just put the price of all these externalities on the food, we can create a different market and everything's going to be fine. And so we did, and we struggled away, and it was good for a time, but in truth, even the sustainable food movement, putting all those costs on the price of the food, couldn't break through. And then eventually, now we're getting close to today, the leaders who'd stood up against this all along got together again and said, something must be done. It's no good just witnessing this destruction of environmental capital, the consequences for public health, for loss of biodiversity, for loss of soil. We have to think about this systemically and we have to get together. We have to make a plan or at least start to make a plan and then we need to turn it out to the public because we will never change this situation, break this spell which everyone has been under, unless we share this story and our conclusion about what needs to be done about it with a wider public. And now we're right up to date. So this begs the question, what's going to happen next? And we don't know because this day is the beginning, hopefully, of a process. It's arguably the largest international gathering that has ever taken place with the incredible eminent people that we've got here today addressing this theme of true cost accounting in food and farming. And we hope that it will be, a big, the, be the beginning of a journey when we move forward and we move into a happier land, more like the children's story, but, but not quite the same, um, where uh, we all live happily ever after. But if you go back to the story again, think about this. 
what is often part of the solution? A charming prince. And in this case, we didn't just have a charming prince. <laughs> we had a visionary prince who actually was instrumental in bringing about these meetings in the first place. And so now it's my great pleasure and my privilege to hand the word over to His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, who actually met the workshop people yesterday, couldn't be here this morning, but is so passionate about this issue that he wanted to say this to us all. <laughs> 